We don't have any Stephen King. You've got the shiny. You mean shiny. Shh. You wanna get sued? It's just your fate. You're that geeky Stephen King kid. There's one of you in every school. Okay, that's him, that's him, that's Cujo, that's Cujo. I was thinking along the lines of no TV and no beer make Homer something, something. Oh, crazy. Don't mind if I do. Hello and welcome to Tower Junkies, presented by ObsessiveViewer.com. Tower Junkies is a podcast celebrating the work of Stephen King, hosted by two lifelong constant readers. We do non-spoiler and spoiler reviews of King's published work and take a critical look at his film and television adaptations as well. We also discuss the latest King news and check in with each other on our ongoing King obsessions. It's the podcast where all things serve the King. You can find more of our work at TowerJunkiesPod.com. You can also like the Facebook page at Facebook.com slash TowerJunkiesPod and follow us on Twitter and every other level of social media at Tower Junkies Pod. And if you'd like to support what we do here, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash obsessive viewer for a ridiculous amount of bonus content, bonus, bonus audio content spread across all of obsessiveviewer.com's various podcasts, including a special tier that for $4 a month, you get access to every Patreon thing as it pertains just to Stephen King stuff. So I do Church of King reactions to short stories and novellas and currently i'm doing a read-along review series of all things holly gibney so i've done mr mercedes in three-part reviews finders keepers and this weekend i'm starting end of watch from there i'm going to do the outsider and then if it bleeds and then holly when it comes out in september so a lot of stuff Consider checking that out, patreon.com slash obsessive viewer. Um, I'm one of your hosts, Matt Hurt. And today on the podcast, we've got a packed show for you as we're going to be reviewing The Boogeyman, the adaptation of Stephen King's short story of the same name from 1978's Night Shift Collection, currently in theaters. And we'll also be talking about the short story The Man in the Black Suit from King's 2002 collection, Everything's Eventual. And joining me to do that, making her what I believe is fifth appearance on the podcast, our dear, dear friend and host of the wonderfully analytical and entertaining as all hell podcast, The Year of Underrated Stephen King. It's the one and only Kim C. Kim, welcome back to the show. How are you doing this evening or early afternoon or what have you? (laughs) (laughs) Hi, Matt. Oh, man. I'm so excited and happy. Lucky number five. I'm thrilled to be here. Oh, yeah. I'm thrilled to have you on. Like, you haven't been on since uh, December of last year, which is, I'm I'm going to apologize for that. And, <laughs> and we're gonna have to have you back on uh, soon enough as well. Because, uh, but, but yeah, yeah, I'm just thrilled to get a chance to chat with you about Stephen King. Yeah. Me too. I love it here. It's truly the best. So thank you for having me. Of course, of course. And uh, of course, you guys can find Kim's work on uh, the year of underrated Stephen King. Kim, would you like to kind of regale the listeners with uh, what you've been up to over on the podcast and where they can find you online and everything? Why, yes, I believe we are kind of everywhere we're mm-hmm. we're, we're plugged into all of the major outlets uh spotify is a good one if you are a subscriber there but i have been up to a little bit of king fantasy lately i spent the first couple months of 2023 taking a good deep dive with four past midnight and yes. it was a good time. It was mm-hmm. really fun. I learned a lot and I was really able to kind of do a nice countdown of the novellas and rank them, which was super fun. Nice. And now having just now finished the eyes of the dragon, I'm in fantasy yes. mode. I am in fantasy zone. So that's, that's where we're plugging in right now. Nice. Yeah. I'm about uh, probably a quarter of the way through your eyes of the dragon review. And like, it makes me really want to read it again. Cause it's been a few years since I've read that and it's just it is like you say it's a delightful like bedtime story but king kingified um it's just it's so it's so charming and unique for him um incredibly yeah. surprising oh man I had a ball I had yeah. 
such a good time with that one, Matt. Nice. I was like, this is magical. I'm loving this. <laughs> Why is it over? Why is there right? no more? This is terrible. <laughs> Had a wonder. Oh, man. Lots of great things to say with that one. I was nice. surprised. I did not know it would be like that. I did mm. not know I would find so much treasure. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I know that I think you said that you are going to go on to fairy tale soon, um, which I'm very excited for you to to do that because that's fresh in my mind because uh, I read it last year. But like it's 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 a it's a it's a it's a good one. It's a good one. Yeah, I I'm I think glad. I had some issues here and there, but it but it was it was it was good. It was very enjoyable. Um, yeah, again, his penchant for like world building and characters is is just amazing. Yeah, I'm excited. That's the part I'm really excited to see Mm because I've noticed with King's sci-fi world building, there's always so much to be desired. Yeah, so much more (laughs) I want. And so with the fantasy, I'm noticing he's given a little bit more details there. So I'm super thrilled. So fairy tale is on deck. However, I I had a really beautiful curveball thrown at me where Mm. this other King title came my way and it's a very well known one. Okay. And I am like, yeah, we're doing it. We're doing it (laughs) all. It's going to be a surprise. Okay. Secret, super secret summer surprise. Nice. I'll tell you after the show, but okay. every, awesome. everybody else will have to wait a little bit because it's absolutely coming from left field. It'll be, nice. it'll be wild, wild times. That's awesome. I can't wait. Uh, that, yeah, absolutely. Cause like, and, and I'm, I'm going to lavish praise upon you, uh, once again, as I, as I usually do when you're on the show, <laughs> obviously, uh, just like your an analysis of, of the work is just unmatched. It's, it's fen- phenomenal. And, it's just it's so so exciting for like listeners to listen to it and oh my gosh uh yeah it's just it's it's a joy whenever i listen to the show matt coming from you that makes my <laughs> heart want to explode like <laughs> it could just burst out of my chest so thank you so much of course of course um also uh oh uh I, I do have a piece of Stephen King news from like last month that I want to talk about uh, before we get into the reviews and everything. But also, um, I want to give a shout out to our mutual friends, uh, the King Size Podcast. Um, oh. Yeah, they just did. They just did a three part just deep dive into eleven twenty two sixty three. Yes, and. They're they're great. They're fantastic. And uh, they reached out to me and they were like, hey, we're going to do the listener thing. If you want to submit a clip for it, I know Kim C is going to be involved, too. And I'm like, oh, yeah, totally. So. Um, so, yeah. So I hope I didn't just like spoil that you're going to be involved in that. But um, no. but, oh, my yeah. God. I'm so excited. You're involved. in it. Yeah, oh my God. I'm I, I sent the sent the clip and they were very, very kind and everything. And I was just like, yeah, awesome. I'm I'm very excited for uh, for that. Um, especially because eleven twenty two sixty three just oh tops, tops for That's me. That's your favorite. It that is, is yeah. Your favorite. Yep, yep. I it, like it's and it's so insane and I, I it's so insane to think about that because I'm the host of Tower Junkies, <laughs> um, <laughs> where we're going through the Dark Tower series where Tiny and I have cr- like we both have said that the Dark Tower is like our preferred, our favorite anything in media and then 11 22 63 comes along and it just kicks my ass and it is <laughs> just perfect storytelling um so yeah so it's just it's yeah anytime i have a chance to talk uh 11 22 63 i just i grab it and i i should probably read that book again because it's just it's so perfect yeah it is it really really is it yeah. brings me so much joy and i love that it's the one that everybody shares it's yeah. the one. Oh yeah oh absolutely and it's it's also just it is so antithetical to what king's like whole vibe is in terms of pop culture because it is it is it, it has all of these elements of king that is evident of everything that he's just a master at but it's it's just it's so beautiful it's so beautiful like it's i don't know it's it's incredible yeah it really is it's it's a masterpiece oh absolutely absolutely yep 
Um, okay, so uh, <laughs> before we get too deep into the rabbit hole of 112263 and get sidetracked into all of that, uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of cut us off there and uh, and and I want to get your thoughts on some Stephen King news that is a bit late now. It's it's a month old, but. I have a feeling that you're going to be very excited when like we're going to have a very lively chat about this. Um, (laughs) The headline is uh, Tom Hiddleston and Mark Hamill to star in Stephen King adaptation, The Life of Chuck for director Mike Flanagan. (laughs) Uh, Just how perfect is that sentence? Um, Just it's it's great. What how did you feel about this news? glittering gold it's just, <laughs> it's just blinding light of of beauty mm-hmm. <laughs> i was like excuse me what what are these words <laughs> who are these people yeah. and just jammed into the same sentence so anytime i feel it's kind of like in regards to the reverence we all have for frank darabont mm-hmm. i feel that's how flanagan is now like anytime yeah. flanagan's name is mentioned with king i gasp audibly oh yeah Absolutely. I gasp audibly and I'm just, my whole soul cheers. I'm just like, yes, yep. we are in the best hands. Mm-hmm. We're in the best hands. I Because for what this man has given the King fans through these adaptations, game-changing, wonderful adaptations, it just blows oh, my mind. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And like, they're difficult adaptations too like it's just it blows my mind just to think that he did gerald's game and dr sleep and he did them in such a way that it's like he is it was like he was looking for the most challenging way to adapt king in the most like center stage way to adapt king and like just it is it is amazing and like him him wanting to take the reins of the dark tower and workshopping that and everything king also retweeted uh like an article or something that was like that was saying like hey amazon you know flanagan wants to do the dark tower and you know everyone like everyone thinks it's a good idea and then king re uh retweeted it and was like yeah the, the writer thinks it's a good idea too and i'm just like oh my god i know just like he he wants like please make it happen <laughs> So oh, man, yeah. I can't believe it's real. I yeah. Mm-hmm. I also when I watched, I'm like, how did Mike Flanagan not only reconcile the, the iconic Kubrick film mm-hmm. to Stephen King's vision, the original vision? Yeah, like a decades old disagreement and fight, <laughs> and and he bridged the film and the novel together and created it for a whole new audience a whole new genre a whole new age group and i it makes my head spin matt i just the brilliance the brilliance and like and and i'm going to i'm going to probably tip my tip my hand at like what a um i don't know if this is going to like this is going to make me look like a snob but (laughs) anytime i read anything like since i am so like centralized like my my brain like automatically wants to like think like like okay how would this be adapted into a movie or tv show so like anytime i read something and then watch the adaptation like my default is like okay i would have done this differently this is this is the wrong way to do it and everything so like there's the that smugness as a reader where we think that we know best and i mean might be talking about some of this later in the episode now that I think about it, but uh, we have this smugness, but like there is, there are things that Mike Flanagan does in his adaptations that I could not have possibly imagined. And it's just, it's, it's remarkable. He's, he is, he is just the best at this. He's, 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 he's our guy. Yeah. You got it. And I'm just so, <laughs> thrilled i'm so thrilled that what he touches is full of power and heart and encompasses king's beautiful writing mm-hmm. and that's the creative we need that's the person Absolutely. that needs to be making mm-hmm. king's vision a reality so i just feel like damn we're lucky we are we so really lucky. are and i kind of feel like 
I, I kind of wonder, and this is just something that's off the top of my head right now, so this might not hold hold to any scrutiny in terms of uh, analyzing like Flanagan versus Darabont or anything, but I feel like, because like you said, like Darabont, he he did amazing work with Stephen King. Like his his adaptations are some of my favorites, if not my favorites. Um, but Flanagan. Like to compare the two of them, I feel like there is a level of Darabont being close enough to King to where he understands it on like a cerebral level of what King's intention is in the writing, whereas Flanagan is more like attuned to like what what uh, what as a constant reader we're experiencing with the with the work and his adaptation i don't know if that really makes as much sense as it does in my brain but um i kind of feel like i feel like darabont comes at it from a from a perspective of like okay i know how king thinks um and i know how the material is in service of how he thinks whereas flanagan's like hey i've been reading this guy for decades I know how I think when I when I read it and this is how I'm going to put it out and it just happens to be exactly how Matt Hurt of Tower Junkies <laughs> um, <laughs> feels and how Kim C feels and how Tiny also if I can speak speak on his behalf. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I wholeheartedly don't know. agree. I wholeheartedly agree. I think you've nailed it. I think that Flanagan is a creative storyteller that is coming from a different place, the reader's mm-hmm. place. Whereas Darabont is coming f- more on the creator side, like you yeah. said. So I think that that's that's it. You nailed it. It's like he's going to make these creative decisions and be a storyteller on behalf of the reader. And yeah. I don't know if Darabont doesn't like that. His mm. is a little different. Both brilliant, both beautifully executed. Absolutely. But um, yeah, I think... Flanagan is the hero we need now. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and also, like, <laughs> this is also going to come across as uh, like, okay, I've already tipped my hand to me being a smug, snobby person. Now I'm going to like try like this is I don't know. This is an anecdote that's not it's going to it's going to seem like I'm I don't I don't know. I'm in my head about it. But anyway, <laughs> Um, related to Dr. Sleep and Stephen King and books and everything, um, there was a recent TikTok controversy. I don't know if you're, uh, on TikTok or anything, but as I've, as I've said to Tiny numerous times, I am now a TikTok guy. Uh, so I, I don't post anything. I just, you know, kill time watching it. But there was a whole thing, like the algorithm sent me to like book talk And there was a whole controversy of this author who she uh, had a book that was uh, going to be published this fall. And she sent uh, advanced reader copies to people. And she saw that one person uh, rated it four stars out of five, which is great, and wrote like a review and everything. And then this author went on TikTok and called her the B word and said, so, yeah, it was like, I had a perfect five star rating. And then this B word went and wrecked it with a four star review and then like criticized her review. And it was like, it was, it was mind blowing just how, how disconnected from reality this person was, because obviously there was a big backlash because like she, she even like, she didn't do anything to disguise like the, the reviewer's identity or anything. And like people were just go like like just giving giving the author like backlash and everything, and then the reviewer posted on her own TikTok saying like like that was the first time she ever got like an advanced review copy. She was excited. She didn't say anything negative about the book. Like it was just a four star review and everything. And like people were saying like, oh, hey, you know, we can, you know, also the, uh, the kind of schadenfreude of that is that the author, her publisher, which was like a, a vanity press publisher, um, that she pays, like, it's not, it's not necessarily self-publishing, but she pays for them to publish it. They dropped her. Um, oh. yeah. And then her book also got review bombed to oblivion on Goodreads 
to the point where Goodreads had to like, like you can go on there and you cannot leave a review for it because they shut off reviews. It's like a one star uh, average. It was just, it was a complete clusterfuck. Um, and yeah. And all the while this author was like posting TikTok saying like acting like, acting like a production studio had contacted her and saying like, yeah, because of all the, all of the free press you guys are giving me, you know, they want to make it into a movie and stuff. It like clearly like trying way too hard to seem like she's not bothered by the backlash and, and doubling and tripling down on it. And not like just saying like, not, not just being like, Hey, I'm sorry. And everything like, like not being willing to, to say that she was in the wrong or anything, but Anyway, the reviewer had posted and people were saying like, hey, yeah, you, you know, uh, we'd love to like help you out or whatever. So she ended up posting a an Amazon wish list. And so I was like, oh, I'm going to check out and see what all's on there. Um, and she had Salem's Lot and Dr. Sleep. So I was like, oh, I'm going to I'm gonna, I'll go ahead and send Dr. Sleep, you know, whatever. Um, so I sent it and uh, hopefully she likes it. So, yeah. Oh, oh my yeah. God. Well, so many things. OK, firstly. <laughs> Uh, you and I are twins in so many ways because <laughs> um, I am a TikToker too, but a total nice. voyeur. I mm-hmm. don't post anything. I just love the human slot machine. I mm-hmm. love that dopamine. I have lost many hours of sleep to TikTok. Yep. I, am a, I am a fan. Um, secondly, this, this author, she is not a writer. This is a person who yeah. has written a book. She is not a writer. Mm-hmm. And that's why she's behaving like a goddamn child. Yep. Um, because first of all, how dare you? How mm-hmm. dare you? When someone reviews your work, you take the good with the bad. You mm-hmm. learn from it. Workshopping is what I do all day long. And it's all about building up a callus, staying true to your original vision, but just learning, learning yeah. that. You're not in there to please everybody, but mm-hmm. get it. This is like, I don't get it. I don't, I just don't get why she behaved that way. Yeah. But the, the largest reason I have, she's not a writer because all yeah. writers who are, who are true writers know that at the end of the day, they're just trying to wrestle magic out of the muse. Mm-hmm. And that is an exhausting process. And at the end of the day, all writers are just, tiny little ants doing their best <laughs> yes. you know yes and tr- true writers know this mm-hmm. and people who write or dabble are they don't and they don't have that in their hearts and souls and so that's why she's a, a buffoon yep. so <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so it's an absolute yeah. buffoon it was it was it was a ride as an observer of it and also this is this is so dumb i might even cut this out because this is so dumb because i don't post anything on tiktok like i have one one tiktok video of uh my my now ex-girlfriend jess her cat clarence and which she just got another cat named marnie and she's adorable but anyway we're still friends and everything obviously um but yeah so uh, I, I've been toying with this idea and it's, it's so dumb. It's so dumb. It, I don't think anyone would really get it, but basically like I, like I had this idea, I might really cut this out. So as I've been listening to a lot more audiobooks and like a lot, a good mix of like fiction and nonfiction, like I have wanted to do like just really quick reactions that are so dumb and so just like. I don't know if the satire would like, like, okay, for example, um, it's so dumb. Um, like I read a book about, it's called the rise and fall of the dinosaurs by Steve Broussat. Um, really good, really good and everything. I was thinking like, what if I just posted a TikTok that was like, okay, yeah. So I just read this book, the rise and fall of the dinosaurs and yeah, asteroids were a mistake. Um, and like, (laughs) And like, uh, so dumb. And like, uh, I read a book about the militarization of police and like, I'd be like, yeah, cops were a mistake. Like just that it's so dumb. It's so dumb. I might cut that out. (laughs) Um, yeah, it's really dumb, but, uh, yeah, (laughs) funny (laughs) with air quotes, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but I just keep doing that anytime I finish a book. I just think about that. And it's 
it's again it's it's just it's really dumb but um <laughs> uh but yeah but i have been uh listening to a lot of audiobooks this year so it's exciting i've been tweeting my uh like goodreads reviews on my obsessive viewer account so if you guys want to find that you can follow along to that and everything actual reviews not like not like my stupid uh <laughs> tiktok things but uh but yeah but anyway there uh, is yeah. just a quick segue because mm -hmm. we're talking about audiobooks. So yeah. I ventured a little bit and I I read, I, I try and keep my horizons open because I've just been on a king train for several years now. Yeah. So a friend of mine gave me this book by a very, very popular romance novelist. I okay. mean, she's, I would say she's a romance novelist and like everything she makes is or she writes is now being turned into films. And so, oh, wow. She's just got all the five stars. Her name rhymes with Colleen Schmoover. Um, oh, yeah. And and so <laughs> she had this, um, as you know, I love all things sexy and gothic. Mm -hmm. And Matt, it was the first time I'd ever read anything by this individual. And it, just this, this was a great premise. Oh, man, it mm -hmm. hooked Kim C. right in. And uh, I was waking up early to read this damn thing, and I was go staying up late to read it. And <laughs> Matt, the ending, I threw that book across the room. <laughs> Lit literally, it caught air. Oh, and, wow. Um, I would like you to read it so we can. Okay. <laughs> it's short and sweet. And okay. <laughs> I, I need I need to vent. I need to vent. Because, okay. I've heard some know, mixed things about her work. Um Yeah. I've heard some like slightly problematic things with her work is involved, but I don't know the specifics or anything, but yeah, I'll keep my eye out. Bingo. <laughs> Especially yeah, if you're I... throwing it around and everything, like I'll definitely keep my <laughs> eye out. So I don't. <laughs> it's been a minute since I got physically violent with a text. Wow. It's been a minute. And uh, I just, I felt a little, a little crazy because it, in my mind, she set up such a spectacular premise and like mm. the clues and, at the end of the story, my imagination was way better and way um, more awesome. And I was like, this is a problem. <laughs> oh, that's um, rough. I got way too much emotion involved. So mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, back back to King. Back to the <laughs> back to the safe place, please. Nice. Um, but yeah, so I understand the the wild ride of reading fiction right now. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of where I'm at too with like we talked, we talked before recording that I have been like using, utilizing the Libby app for the library and like using like audiobooks there. So I have like a massive list of just books that I want to listen to from there. Um, and I have like subsequent tags for it where it's like, okay, these are just the books that I want to prioritize for like the summer and like being like by the pool, listen to these audiobooks and everything. And a lot of them are like horror like current like modern contemporary horror novels and thrillers that are kind of in the same vein as king's work but obviously king is above everything but it's really interesting and it's something that i've like i've had in my i've had this thought in my brain a lot when reading like can like the current crop of contemporary like horror and thriller novelists and everything but like like people like grady hendrix and paul tremblay and like seeing the influence of King in their writing, like today I just finished uh, the Sundown Motel by uh, Simone St. James, which was really phenomenal. I really, really liked it. It's a story about a girl who or a woman who goes to uh, a small town and she starts working at a motel where her her aunt 35 years ago disappeared from and so it's this dual narrative where you have the perspective of the the aunt from 197 or 1982 and then 2017 with the with the niece uh and they're running concurrently it swaps back and forth and everything and it's just Ooh. such it's really good it's like there's this element to it that like the the mystery is really really solid and there's the supernatural element of it that like there's and there's plenty of like little like Stephen King references like like the number 217 and <laughs> like name chat like referencing like a character reading Firestarter like actually like incorporating King and everything. But something that I really liked about it is that 
the 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 supernatural stuff is like completely secondary to the mystery and the story of the two the two lead characters in different timelines and everything which just made it feel just so like open and organic and engrossing i just i really really liked it so that's my recommendation yeah i write that one down i need because i need i need redemption Mm -hmm. and the colleen hoover title i speak of is called verity for anybody out there who has similar (laughs) feelings you let matt and i know because i gotta i gotta talk about it with (laughs) y'all nice Um, (laughs) but um i need redemption so that Mm -hmm. book sounds incredible and i'm gonna plug it into the queue nice i highly recommend it. it's the sundown motel uh by uh simone st james uh really good and i'm gonna check out more of her stuff too because like i think she has one that's i think the cold case girls i'm i'm not sure but anyway i'm i'm a fan now so i'm excited Yay! to dive in so yeah um okay um would you like to actually start talking about <laughs> stephen king and the stuff that we're reviewing tonight <laughs> I'm not in a hurry. I'm with my bestie. Nice. So we'll get there. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, yeah. So I figure that we'll start with the Boogeyman, uh, the adaptation. That's what we're doing today. We're going to be reviewing the Boogeyman directed by Rob Savage. It's currently in theaters. And then we're also going to be talking about the man in the black suit from Everything's Eventual. Uh, so yeah. So let's dive into the Boogeyman. Um, I'm going to go ahead and Uh, give like the premise and everything uh the premise according to imdb is still reeling from the tragic death of their mother a teenage girl and her younger sister find themselves plagued by a sadistic presence in their home and struggle to get their grieving father to pay attention before it's too late again it was directed by rob savage writers were scott beck brian woods and mark Heyman. uh of course based on the short story from night shift titled the boogeyman and the cast includes Sophie Thatcher, Chris Messina, uh, Vivian Le- Lyra B- Blair, David Desmalchian, and Marin Ireland, who I believe Marin, Marin Ireland has done some uh, voice work for the audiobooks for Stephen King. I think she did Sleeping Beauties. I'm not 100% sure. Um, but anyway, uh, this movie is currently in theaters. It was originally going to be on Hulu, um, just like put on Hulu, but I guess after test screenings, they decided to go theatrical, uh, which is a good sign and everything. Um, and of course, Kim, you were on the show sometime last year. We talked about the boogeyman, the short story. So obviously we had to have you back for the movie. Um, (laughs) what (laughs) were your expectations going into the movie? And of course we're going to do a non-spoiler and then spoiler review, check the timestamps and everything. But how did you feel kind of in non-spoilers about, uh, the boogeyman? Okay. Well, I really enjoyed my Matt H. homework from last year. (laughs) Super enjoyed The Boogeyman. I thought it was totally fun. I loved the narrative structure and the surprise ending. So the short story, huge fan. Mm -hmm. Going into The Boogeyman, I was a little nervous because I (laughs) am not the bravest when it comes to uh, horror films. I just (laughs) don't have as much gonads as I would like. Um, for example, Matt, I went to the theater with a blanket, A, because the <laughs> air conditioning is very cold, mm-hmm. but also because I need security. And <laughs> so I have like a little blanket in my lap. Nice. Yeah, it's the whole thing. <laughs> so from the previews, I knew it was going to be creaturey. I knew mm-hmm. this was going to be a monster. And that excited me. I was mm-hmm. excited. I, I can handle monsters. Slashers? Nice. No, not so much. <laughs> Cannot, cannot with slashers, Mm -hmm. can't. Ghost monsters, bring it on all day, all day. So I was looking forward to seeing how close they were going to be to the narrative. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, do you want to know like my movie thoughts or like initial thoughts? Let's let's do your movie thoughts and then we can dive into like the story. Because like the, the thing that I keep coming back to is that like, it it really feels like the movie was at some point in production they realized oh we have the rights to the boogeyman <laughs> so let's let's pay david desmalchian for a day to come in and shoot a scene that is basically the short story and then we're going to do everything else that we have in the script already that's not related <laughs> so <laughs> uh so as a 
yeah, pick your poison, uh, <laughs> whichever you want to go, whatever avenue you want to go down. Copy that. So complete feelings are um, can be summed up in a noise, which is I don't know if that's a good thing, but <laughs> I'm driving home from the theater and I ask myself, all right, Kim C, let's succinctly put a a review on this. How do we feel? And it was like, hmm. <laughs> The teacher in me, I'm always taking into account the positive. I'm always mm-hmm. looking at like the good things. And there's there's some good things. There's some there's some fun little things in here that I enjoyed. But then I was like, I really wish they would have taken a different direction with the story. <laughs> So because of that, balancing the things I liked in a summer popcorn movie, in a Mm -hmm. monster thriller, with the fact that uh, we had like a (laughs) sprinkling of the story, (laughs) like a little salt shake, and then that was it. And so that makes me like, oh, man. So it's a hmm. (laughs) (laughs) That is totally fair. And that's kind of where I'm at with it, too. Like... Everything, every like everything about it feels kind of, kind of cookie cutter, and and there's not really like when when you go into a movie like this, like a monster movie, like you said, a like kind of summer, like as a counter to like comic book movies and stuff. So like this is a genre movie that is in theaters. It is supposed to be spooky. It's supposed to be scary. It's if you give yourself to it, it's going to do its job at best or at best or maybe at worst. It's you're not going to remember it three weeks later, but it'll be fun in the moment. And there were some pretty solid scares throughout it. Um, But just as a whole, it really felt just kind of a little bit piecemealed, uh, piecemealed together and when it gets to the run at the end, which we'll talk about in spoilers, um, it just felt like it had exhausted everything and was working towards just like, okay, we need to wrap it up in a way that, you know, if we had adhered more to the short story, like we would have King, like have him hold our hand with how to, how to actually tell the story. But by that point they had abandoned everything about the short story. But um, yeah, it just, it just felt a little bit cookie cutter and, uh, run of the mill which is a shame it's a shame because the the stuff is there to be something pretty pretty solid and good um but they kind of just eh, like like you said eh. um <laughs> yeah it's really meh i agree with yeah. you it's like uh you 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 really passed by some golden eggs there like yeah. you had some golden opportunities to harvest some magic out of the yeah. short story we pass those right on by <laughs> yep yeah and it's like i understand from like a business perspective like i'm sure that there is a bunch of market research and a bunch of stuff that goes into the productions of movies and obviously they're throwing a lot of money even with a relatively low budget here there's st- that's still an investment and in everything but like i don't understand why why they can't be more creative with it like like okay uh, a couple of months ago i saw the pope's exorcist which is a goofy ass but pretty fun and funny movie like exorcist movie uh is that the one with russell crowe <laughs> yes him oh my riding God, a I wanna Vespa. See that. it's a lot of fun it's actually it's it's a it's very goofy it's very okay. very goofy um but at the heart of it like it is it is definitely like a vehicle for russell crowe to kind of just chew scenery and be like the center of attention and be kind of in a fun exorcist role and that's fine and everything but also it's like they just put like maybe close to the same plot of this into it to be in the background like that plot involves a family who just lost their father and then possession happens here we have a family who just lost their mother and then boogeyman happens and it's just I just I just wish that there was more creativity brought into it but it's 
it it's just not there. <laughs> um, yeah. I yeah. kept holding on to hope, Matt, because like my hope we'll talk about in the next section. But mm-hmm. I was like, they're gonna connect the two. <laughs> we're gonna get a we're gonna get a twist. We're gonna get a surprise. I know it. I know it's coming. I know it's coming. The movie's over. What? Yep. <laughs> yep. Exactly. It's just. It's yeah. It's such a shame. And I mean. I probably I don't know how I would have felt about it if it just wasn't connected to Stephen King. Like all told, I probably wouldn't even have bothered seeing it, obviously. Um, but Same. yeah, but like but I just I just feel like there should have been something more. I don't I don't know how else to really ex- express it. And then I had I, I also I talked about this on Patreon. So if you're on Patreon, I'm apologize for the repetition, but I had like a, a somewhat weird theater experience, which I usually have weird theater experiences anyway. But <laughs> um, this was the first time that this has happened to me. Um, I like the theater was was reasonably filled. It was one of the smaller auditoriums. Uh, first, there was this kid that was sitting like like diagonal behind me who like would very be very animated whenever a scare comes up and he would scream and say like, Oh, my scream count is five. And I'm just like, okay, just get it out of your system because that's, that's really bothering me. (laughs) Oh dear. Yeah. But another family came in like after, after the trailers and after the opening scene and like, I'm sitting in my seat and then they sit on the opposite end of the aisle. And then this little girl from that group comes up to me and (laughs) as the movie's going and she's like, excuse me, is this the boogeyman? And like, I understand like they thought that they were maybe in the wrong theater. And I was like, yes, it is. And I'm just like, that's never happened to me before. (laughs) I'm like, what the, okay, (laughs) please go back to your seat. (laughs) Um, But it was, it was weird. It was a, it was a decent, you know, theater experience though. Like there was one, one, (laughs) one scare where, Someone else in the audience, uh, scre- like like legit, like not performative, but like reacted and screamed because they were shocked by it. And like it was, it was actually it was actually hilarious because right after that she was like, "I'm sorry, everyone." <laughs> and I was like, "That's that's good, that's good." But that yeah, so fun. You got yeah. a lively group, Matt. I yeah. got so lucky. I was completely alone. I love those experiences. Oh. I love those so much. That is awesome. It was magic. It was just me and my blanking and my popcorn. Nice. <laughs> that is I loved it. That is great. Dang. I'm I'm envious of that. <laughs> Although um, it is yeah. it is just like a little like there are parts where it's very unnerving. Oh, I'm yeah. like looking looking over my shoulder. <laughs> what's right, behind right. me. <laughs> it's also kind of funny too that like I I saw last week and not to go on to a tangent or anything, but last week I saw a I was at a press screening for the Flash that's coming out this week. And then I saw um this on Saturday and both this and the Flash, while I like and you'll be able to sympathize with me here, uh as I'm going through like tooth pain, like both <gasps> the Flash and this movie in, involve something with teeth. Mm. being like removed and i'm just like what in the sorcery of the world is this like why are you guys why is the movie industry reminding me of my pain and kim <laughs> c's pain as oh well my God. <laughs> we were twinning so hard mm-hmm. on so many levels with dental woe yes <laughs> yes and i apologize i hope i didn't put you on the spot there um <laughs> Yeah. I don't mind. I think it's a wonderful public service announcement mm-hmm. to everybody out there. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> if you have a dentist who just hits the golf course before <laughs> looking at your mouth like mine did, you're going to need two root canals mm-hmm. and your friend Matt's going to ask Ooh. you to record and you can't move <laughs> your mouth because you are within an inch of your sanity mm-hmm. of dental pain. So, but yeah, no, yep. if you have a dentist who who dips out to the golf course and doesn't look at your mouth get a new dentist everybody yes i i will co-sign that and (laughs) on my part if you don't go to the dentist regularly go to the dentist regularly (laughs) because 
it's it's very painful uh, if you don't. And then you get really freaked out about everything. Also, something I didn't mention is that when they do the x-rays and everything, this is a total tangent, nothing to do with the boogeyman. But when they do the x-rays, like I was sitting there and I was just like, how is it 2023 and we don't have a better way to do this? Because like I'm like, like my gag reflex is activating to the point where the hygienist was like, you said it was just the left side, right? So maybe we don't need to do the full thing. <laughs> I'm just like, I, yeah, it's bad. So the suffering is really firing on all cylinders when <laughs> yes. it comes to to mouth stuff. Let me yes. tell you. Oh yeah. Oh my my god, Matt! I consumed so much ibuprofen in the last <laughs> month. My poor liver. Who knows what I did to it. <laughs> Same, same here. And Origel was my best friend for the five minutes it was active. And then, and then it's just back to normal. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's been a ride. It's been a ride, but, that but we're has. here. I am, yes. Well, thank goodness. I am pain free and broke, but I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> same, same here. <laughs> Seriously. It's, it's, yeah. It's, the shocking cost of stupid teeth like yeah i just i'm just trying to live i just <laughs> i'm just trying to chew and and drink cold water sometimes not yep. all the times yep yeah oh uh yeah i had to miss out on a uh an activity with some friends where we were like getting together to watch like just a a whole like day's worth of just schlocky movies and stuff and like the day of i'm just like I can't make it, you guys. Like, I'm in pain. Unless you want to hear me just screaming intermittently, like, <laughs> I can't make it. And I felt really bad, but I'll be at the next one. But I was just bummed out by that. Um, but yeah. Uh, so anyway, so... We if, made it. Yes, we made it. yes. If this tangent doesn't tell you guys how <laughs> how the boogeyman is, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. Because it is... It's really as cookie cutter as you as you can get. Um, and before we go into spoilers, because we'll talk a little bit more in detail and spoilers, especially about what I'm about to say. But like to kind of go back into my whole theory that they just threw in the short story content into the movie at the last minute. Like there is in terms of the way the narrative is presented, it is so disconnected at the beginning, because that opening scene I thought was really effective, having a baby in a room in a crib and just having just the atmosphere, the tone establishing, and then horror happens. And then you get the like opening title and then suddenly it's like, OK, well, now we have a family who their mother just died and now we have to be introduced to them. And I'm like, th there is no connection to the beginning, the opening scene to that and then it's not until later because that's that's where the short story content comes into play but like i'm just like wh like why why front load it with something and then and then just introduce us to something else it was a little bit a little bit aggravating to me did you have that experience at all <laughs> i did i did because i was hoping that the twist element was going to be incorporated mm. so when we first get to know the family and i hear the name of somebody i'm like oh okay and so i kind of suspended all of my initial misgivings because mm -hmm. i'm like whoa, 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 well they're gonna do something with it because yeah that that's got to be where it's headed, right? And so <laughs> I suspended a lot, hoping, hoping, hoping mm -hmm. that they were going to tie it in somehow. And so I was just given slack left and right, hoping. Yeah. And, and then I started to have, you know, once we get like midsies, middle of the movie, <laughs> I'm like, uh-oh, SpaghettiOs. <laughs> uh, I don't know if if they're going to do that. And then the the real deflation happened <laughs> like... <laughs> Okay, well, if that's how they're gonna roll, then I, I, I'd be disappointed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 really it's it's really kind of kind of rough, and um, like I don't. I, I, so Rob Savage, the director, he, um, he previously did in 2020, he did Host, um, which I don't know if you saw that. It was like a found footage screen life thing where it was all it was a seance like a, a 
pandemic era Zoom seance movie. Uh, really cool, really effective, really unique. And then either last year in 20 or in 2021, he had dash cam, which I think was the same. I didn't see it, but I guess it was the same kind of principle of that. It was all through dash cam footage. Really didn't hear good things about it. Um, and then here we have this, which is, it's, it's a competently made movie. There are some sequences that are really good. Um, but I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know where I'm going with that. Did you see either of his other movies? <laughs> you know, I did not. Cause mm-hmm. I, it's, it's gotta take a lot for Kim mm-hmm. C to get to the horror theater. Yeah. Um, I really, really need Stephen King's name attached to it in mm-hmm. order to put, put my mind and body through, <laughs> through, um, totally understand the, that. Yeah. I mean, I love, I love a uh, suspense. I love, mm-hmm. um, and some horror movies I'm a huge fan of. I nice. really do have, um, a lot of appreciation for the classics mm-hmm. and some of the old school ones and some of the new ones. So nice. especially if they're vintage, like the mm-hmm. Conjuring's probably my favorite. So it's come out nice. in the past, past few years. I really love vintagey ghosty. Mm-hmm. So, it, it just, I am selective, very, mm-hmm. very selective. So if there's really nothing that has, if there's no gothic, if there's mm-hmm. no Stephen King, if there's no ghosts, I'm like, I'll pass. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that is totally understandable and respectable. I totally get that. Um, the no other... haunted house, I'm out. Mm-hmm. I mean, oh, yeah, totally. Um I I yeah I love that kind of that kind of vibe just the yeah that's your yeah, thing that's your yeah. thing oh yeah anything that can make me feel uncomfortable at home is is good and I don't think this will do that but <laughs> they're like I will say like just throwing this it out there it won't do much it won't do <laughs> yeah throwing it out here I've talked about it before elsewhere I'm sure but last year uh, the movie Barbarian absolutely fantastic fantastic creepy okay. it is it is it is so freaking good and it's amazing that like the guy who directed it is one of the people of like the comedy troupe uh whitest kids you know who had a show on like ifc they do just goofy goofy sketches and like he made like this premium like incredible horror movie with like justin long's in it uh, uh bill skarsgård uh, Pennywise is in it. It's it's phenomenal. So anyway, I recommend that Barbarian. <laughs> um, uh, I will yeah. take all of your suggestions. Nice. Cause you're you're the guy. You the nice. guy I listen to. <laughs> well, let me know what you think of it if you do check it out. And I want to I want to see yeah. Pope's Exorcist though because. <laughs> Me and my guy, like, we've been mm-hmm. in this, um, he's been playing Diablo, and we've been oh, in nice. this, like, angel devil stuff lately, because, <laughs> like, it's so, f- I love archangel stuff, mm-hmm. I love devil stuff, which sounds weird, but, like, <laughs> I I do, I, I'm, I'm such a flag girl, Randall mm-hmm. Flag's my fave, so it's like, I love it! Bring nice. it on. So uh, nice. anything devilly, I'm kind of open to, which is nice. a horrible sentence. I don't mean that in real life. I just mean I'd, like... <laughs> I'd be very interested to know what you think of Pope's Exorcist because it is such a weird tone, hodgepodge. Like it's it's like Russell Crowe knows... what. Like It's like he has an idea of what he wants to do with the role and like the movie around it thinks it's it thinks it's making like a a high high like octane thriller horror movie in some respects it is but like russell crowe's like no i'm gonna make a meal of this this is gonna be my show this is this is me having fun and it is it's such a weird combination it's a lot of fun um yeah (laughs) so uh okay final thing before we go to spoilers um did you catch any of the stephen king references in the movie no okay there are a few I, that i detected <laughs> uh i mean maybe i uh, i haven't read carrie yet so mm. is there a little bit of carrie maybe no no okay no. then i then i i missed a moment <laughs> okay they're they're very just like quick like and it's not like too deep or anything but like the address of lester billings is 217 oak drive so 217 from the shining okay yeah it, yeah 
And then another one similar to that is that when they go back to the house at the, toward the end of the movie, you see that the uh, that the number on the on the house is nineteen. So Stephen King is nineteen. Uh, so yeah, so that's really the only two that I can remember. But but yeah. But anyway, uh, do you want to go into spoilers for the Boogeyman? <laughs> let's do it buddy okay awesome so i'm gonna play a clip from the trailer if you don't want to listen to our spoiler discussion of the boogeyman and want to skip over to our talk about the man in the black suit uh check the show notes for timestamps. you can also find those timestamps or show notes at towerjunkiespod.com slash zero eight seven uh so i'm gonna play a clip from the trailer and when we come back we're gonna be spoiling the boogeyman our minds try to fill in the blanks Sometimes the best thing to do is to face it. So this light is going to be completely solid like it is right now. And gradually, it's going to start flashing until it's totally dark. So you can see that there's nothing to be afraid of. Okay? See? That's not so scary, is it? Just you, your sister, and me. Okay. Okay, spoilers on for the boogeyman and I did not mean to make the clip from the trailer like the most boring part of the trailer. <laughs> but um but that's where we are here. Um so spoilers on for the boogeyman um a couple of things up top um i appreciated um oh oh the other stephen king references that i assume were references was uh the older daughter's name is sadie which i hope is a reference to eleven twenty two sixty three. oh yeah yeah and the younger daughter's name is sawyer which i haven't read um i haven't read the talisman or black house but i know that the character in those books as Jack Sawyer. Uh, so maybe there's a reference there that's intentional, but, um, but yeah, but anyway, um, the, I, I was kind of into the older daughters, um, her like friend group or frenemy group and the just bullying and the aggravation and everything. But, like with everything else in this movie, it's just, it's touched on a little too lightly and it's not explored too fully. So how did you respond to that? The friend group or just? Uh, yeah, the friend group stuff. Yeah. For me. Okay. So when I went into that theater, I had the <laughs> the short story in mind, Matt. Mm -hmm. I just locked on. And so nice. what I love about the short story is that the ending is super twisty. And you find out that Lester Billings, who's been divulging his monologue of doom to this therapist, Dr. Harper. Mm -hmm. And at the very <laughs> end of the story, Dr. Harper is the monster. Yes. Right? So when I meet Dr. Harper, I'm like, it's you, it's you, you're the monster. <laughs> so that I could not let go of that, Matt, the mm -hmm. whole time. So with his daughters, I was like, oh, my God, this is effed up because he's the monster. He's the dad. <laughs> oh, my God, this is so dark. Holy crap. He's killing other children. Mm -hmm. Why did he kill Lester's children? Dr. Harper. It's Dr. Harper. It's Dr. Harper. <laughs> so, <laughs> so when I was paying attention to Sadie, I thought, they did a wonderful job with those actresses. Well, oh, yeah. Stars. Oh, yeah. Both of them. Both of them are tremendous. And like, God, high school, such a toilet bowl. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I just I I thankfully I had like a very neutral experience in high school. Thankfully, mm -hmm. I was surrounded by a bunch of gays who were amazing. <laughs> and I just had uh, the nice. time of my life in high school. But, you know, you, I didn't fit in. No one fits in, you know. Oh, yeah. And so. Oh, yeah. So it makes me sad that like she's around such trash humans and I'm like, yeah. girl, get away from these hoes. Like you are, <laughs> right. you are a shining star and you are grieving. Mm -hmm. um, so the friend stuff, I get it, but it seemed a little contrived because I'm like, yeah. who, who in the F says this to a person who just lost their yeah, mother? On her first day back at school. <laughs> um Yeah. Yeah, I did like the kind of setup <laughs> of like the dress and and the the moldy food in the locker and how that all played out. Like that made me feel like that that made me really feel for the character. 
And that made me like that, that got me like it resonated with me and I, I appreciated that. But then later in the movie when it's like, like you said, it's contrived, like them being like, okay, well, we're going to have like a, like a party, like you're going to come over and hang out. And I'm like, okay, they just, it's just, it is, it is the most contrived way to get a group of kids in, in this room or in this house and okay, fine, whatever it, yeah. Also, Matt, would you ever, 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 ever do drugs when your dad's downstairs? <laughs> right? No. <laughs> so, like, yeah. Like, okay. Yeah. That's. <laughs> I did. Come I did. On. Yeah. I did appreciate how that tied into him, him, like him, like very, very fatherly and and uh understandingly saying like well maybe you didn't say, like because i can smell the weed on you like how high are you because that could be, be a factor there he's not like he's not very admonishing toward her or anything he's just like he's looking at it logically and i'm like yeah okay that that i i like that that's set up even as ridiculous as it is <laughs> to get to that to to build to that it's still it still is effective enough uh storytelling as effective as it can be in this in this movie (laughs) i agree i think you're right i think he they did make it work (laughs) they (laughs) did make it work which was good Mm -hmm. but i yeah i guess gen z's lucky and you could just clam bake with your parents downstairs because like i that to me i was like wow okay um it's a it's a different world kim c it's a different (laughs) world (laughs) right i i tell you other people's children let's Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, but yeah, I, the, the friend stuff, I, I was more really pleased with little sister Sawyer. What Mm -hmm. a star. Oh yeah. And, and I was so into what, who, how the creature was becoming human. Mm -hmm. Like, and that was what I want. I couldn't let it go, Matt. I just would not let it go. I was like, somehow I'm going to find out that the girl's therapist is the monster or Dr. Harper's the monster. Yeah. Like (laughs) why not, why not make the girl's therapist the monster? Because like the part in the short story that like sticks with you is that the monster, the boogeyman is like wearing, wearing the therapist as a suit. Like I just remembered that part of the short story (laughs) and like, Cause like up until this point when I just remembered that I'm thinking like, yeah, the whole stuff with David Des- Desmalchian where he is talking and giving, giving that very creepy uh, that performance. That is fantastic. And I'm just thinking like, okay, well they got the, the short story stuff out of the way, but I'm like, no, they just, they just didn't do the best thing about it. Like, Oh, they, th- that could have been so cool and so effective. And they, they had, they could have had their cake and eaten it too by having the girls therapist be that and not the father, like still like have like that insanely creepy ending, but ugh, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. It, it's That's so such frustrating. A missed opportunity. Yes, yeah. Matt. It's such a missed opportunity. And the part, my favorite part of the movie was actually when Lester Billings also, another sort of WTF, <laughs> if you are a behavioral therapist or a professional counselor, would you ever, ladies and gentlemen, have a client come to your home? Because, yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's why that is so, so weird, unethical, yeah, and maybe illegal. I don't know. But <laughs> yeah. um, so my favorite scene is when Lester Billings arrives at the home of Dr. Harper. Mm-hmm. WTF. Don't know. Radical <laughs> acceptance. We're moving sure. on. And he he gives that really, really creepy monologue about how all three of his kids have been killed and it's this mm-hmm. creature. And I was like, yeah, now we're cooking with gas. All yeah. right. And shortly after, Lester dies by I don't know, Matt, like he's, he yeah. hangs himself, did he? And that's why I was like, oh man, Dr. Harper, the monster killed him. Dr. Harper I, wasn't in the same yeah. room. So then now once I realized, okay, it wasn't Dr. Harper. It was just the monster killed you, Lester. Mm-hmm. Cool. Cool story. Awesome. Like it could have been like, if, if I could, if I could, if I could, um, th- if I can throw a quick like wishing well. Uh, scenario here yeah so 
there's a scene where um sadie is she's she's come home in the middle of in the middle of the day she doesn't know that the patient is in there uh and and her father doesn't know that that she's there she's putting the putting the dress in the washer and everything and then like we get the eerie like kind of cookie cutter and cliched like eeriness of uh of lester standing there staring at her and then not there and everything and it's all creepy like they could there was an opportunity there to make it more cohesive in having like 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 he could have just said something like something like i didn't realize he had kids i'm so sorry for what's about to happen or whatever because the whole thing is like it it goes it follows people and everything like that would have been that would have been a good way to connect things but then we get his wife um in the house later and like that's that was mm-hmm. okay but i it just it just feels like they could have just made it a lot cleaner and a lot more engrossing if they would have done something better with lester um yeah wholeheartedly agree and also matt what is with the spider webbing on the roof and, or not roof ceiling and walls oh and- yeah Oh yeah, I have no idea. Like there was no like real. I, Me neither. I yeah. yeah just I, aesthetics, I guess. Yeah. Also, also not to completely <laughs> rag on the movie, but I mean that's we're here for this. They, so. they signed up for it. Yeah, but <laughs> the whole like the scene with his wife with 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 um with with Lester's wife saying that like like giving the exposition dump of what the like what the rules of the boogeyman is and everything it's like you need to you know it it lives in the darkness so you need to keep the light on and everything it's like and like it's understand like there's candles everything it's good ambiance and everything but it's like turn on the lights at any point in the movie <laughs> like just turn on the lights like it's it's that like and i i hate to be that like reductive of it but like when it sets up the rules of it and she says like it needs to be in the light and everything like carry like big ass flashlights or flood lamps or something like not just a little lighter (laughs) and like i just it that that kind of bothered me a a bit um right why are we using like zippos you need yeah (laughs) i want military grade plane landing lamps yes (laughs) yes like blinding to the human eye that's what i want in this home 24 7 exactly exactly like the like the um the the seinfeld bit where kramer's apartment is right across from uh uh kenny rogers roasters chicken and the neon sign so his (laughs) his whole apartment is just red (laughs) so like i love that that episode yeah me too um yeah yeah and yeah yeah any more on that or (laughs) like there's another point i want to bring up but i want to make sure that we dog this as much as we can (laughs) so my favorite scene to Mm. throw like a a little bit of a positive nugget is Mm. lil sawyer i don't know her actress name but Mm. what a star wow oh amazing Um, i love when she is in the closet with christmas lights wrapped around her yes um, I thought that was great because she wanders into another room and the Christmas lights are like the thread, the the slack is, mm-hmm. it, it works and they're flashing red and green. And I, there was some really cool aesthetic little moments yeah. where I was like, I love this. This is so good. This is like oh, yeah. cute and it's got personality and that was like my favorite scene and I don't was that air freshener or what was the spray? I I don't know. I assume I don't know either. air freshener or like like raid or something. I I don't know. Um <laughs> but yeah, but that was fine too. Um the- <laughs> I'm really grasping it. And, yeah. Um, we're we're scraping the barrel yeah. for sure to yeah. give credit. And like I, I will give it credit for the emotional impact of the the lighter 
like how it sets up like okay you know if if you can hear me mom like you know that was sweet bend it to the left yeah and like when when that kind of comes to comes to like uh fruition and like it it lights up and everything it's like okay that's that's effective that's good that's that's good that's that's good resolution to the to the grief storyline and everything so that that was fine um i also really liked when um girlfriend sadie gets pinned by the creature yeah and whoa that was some design Matt. yeah like this this thing is opening and this gaping maw and there's like hands and another face and i was like yes. whoa i always love creature design and i oh I yeah could, i was on board for the design elements mm-hmm. of this monster i was like okay this is kind of like a two people like one swallowed the other and <laughs> yeah. and and so there's kind of like these bloody energy tendril tentacle things mm-hmm. happening and i thought something was gonna happen with that like <laughs> uh-oh now sadie's gonna be the boogeyman like she's it's oh, transferring yeah. some sort of energy or power once yeah. more giving the story more credit than right <laughs> <laughs> giving it more opportunities to succeed of which yeah. they completely flush them mm-hmm. so <laughs> i was so hoping that something would happen with that like uh-oh yeah like, sadie's been transformed and she's gonna kill ch- children i mm-hmm. don't know and nope that <laughs> that was effective like visual effects and everything it definitely feels like it is taking a nod from uh from it and like uh, like the the dead light scene in it chapter one um yeah i i i did i did enjoy that and also the the design the creature design that kind of that like spider like design feels very at home for stephen king and was reminiscent of like the creatures in the mist and everything Mm -hmm. so there was there was some good stuff there um yeah yeah um Anything else we haven't torn to shreds yet? <laughs> right? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of trying to look at the movie 360. And mm-hmm. personally, I just... Um, the Dr. Harper, the dad thing, it's so... What's going on, Matt? Like, yeah. They introduce him as this psychologist, and then he really disappears out of frame in terms of importance. Yeah. And there's so I'm kind of, yeah yeah what, there's what? like there's like one line where the girl's psychiatrist says like you need to talk about her you can't like you can't just ignore it and everything and I'm like okay okay I get what you guys are doing you're trying to establish this so that the end scene where they're all together and everything like is is good and they're healed and everything but like you need to give him more of an arc than just one line. <laughs> like yep. you like, and I, like, I'd have to go back and watch it again, but like, I feel like that may have also been like something that they added in post. Like, I feel like she's not on screen and I feel like that might be ADR. <laughs> um, like, I can't confirm or deny that, but like, I feel like that's like something that they're like, oh shit, we're in trouble. We need to make this connect. So like, get her back and get her in the, in the, in the booth and have her record a line so that we can do this. Um, yeah. I'm going to toss a coin into the wishing well as well, because I am, I cannot let go of the Dr. Harper thing. I know I'm just (laughs) like a broken record, Matt. Understandably so. Yeah, I just yeah. wanted it to go down so bad because my thought process with the dad being super uh, distant and uh, what's the word non in non communicative. I don't know. That doesn't sound right sure. in my mind right now. <laughs> <laughs> He's not real chatty. Sure. He doesn't want to connect. He doesn't want to open up. That's mm-hmm. And I was convinced. I was like, that's because you killed your wife, Dr. Harper. You killed her. You killed the wife because the wife found out that you're a crazy monster from the depths. And she found out your true identity. That would have been so cool. Right. That's what. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's what I wish would have happened. Yeah. In order to throw in a final twist, the girl psychologist is also a monster. Double monsters. Yes. In human form. Monsters all the way down. 
Yeah. Right? And then the girls have to kill their dad. And mm-hmm. but it's not their dad. It's just the husk of their dad. And maybe he's in some cocoon like Pennywise did. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which I, you know, I know it's been done, but so has mm-hmm. this stupid yeah, movie. <laughs> exactly. There's there's like no like originality in this movie. Yeah, there's just like glimmers of it. For someone who doesn't watch horror movies, I have seen this before. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which was sad. Like, yeah. I barely go to these things. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, the hell? Yep. This is it? Yep. This this is it, really? Oh, oh. yeah. And my my other, like, just slight nitpick about this movie is that, and it also kind of goes into my theory that maybe they didn't, maybe they weren't working with a full script um, when they were shooting it. But, like... There's a scene, like one of the first scenes with the whole family, the father is driving the daughters to school and he is, he's like, he, he is, um, uh, playing with, with Sawyer. He's joking with her while he's driving. He is looking back the entire time. It's one of those classic like movie scenes where like, just watch the road and like, (laughs) that's fine. Like I can suspend my disbelief for that like I, that doesn't bother me but then later in the movie they reveal that the mother died in a car accident like if oh, this yeah. family is grieving <laughs> you would think that he would not be recklessly like he, he would be very much focused on the road and then that scene even ends with him telling sadie to put her seatbelt on like you're you didn't say that at the beginning of the trip when your wife died in a car accident like what oh my god matt that is huge <laughs> huge you unearthed a huge one that is so glaringly wrong <laughs> <laughs> it just oh, it bothered wow. me so much so much yeah. Now I'm oh I'm horrified now. Yeah. I'm horrified. Horrified. Yep. Who missed that? Who yeah. missed that? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Ugh, jeez. Huh. <sighs> um problems. problems. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, what it what it yeah. makes me think of though is that like we're really smart and <laughs> I I think we got to get in there and help these people. We Matt. do. We, we do. Somehow, that we yes. need to get on payroll, just tiny payroll, but like, oh, absolutely, we, we can help you guys, we yes. can really help you, yeah, make some prevent some big mistakes going down, right? And you know, <laughs> one of my, my favorite quotes of all time, and I've been thinking mm. about it as we've been chatting, is mm. it's actually from Justin Timberlake, and it's such oh, a nice. brilliant quote, it's, a, it's such a brilliant uh thing he says, um. In regards to creativity and creation, he says, no matter how much work you have put into something, how much love and time, devotion, blood, sweat, tears, just know that the second you give it to the world, someone is going to throw shit at it. Like Uh, someone will will smear shit all over it. And as long as you know that, you can forge ahead. Like you can be okay. I love that. (laughs) <laughs> Isn't it great? Yes. It's so helpful. It's so oh, helpful. Yeah. Like you're ready for the poop to be yes. slung at you and just to <laughs> to land right right in the middle, you know? Yes. And so I think about that. Like you have to prepare yourself for when you're making something like, mm-hmm. all right, let's look at it from a with a critical eye. Like mm-hmm. what are they gonna find? You we at the end of the day you can only do your best, of course, but like you need a panel of people yeah. to, to just be a, a neutral party and completely let you know, like, bro, this is sucking. This exactly. Is thumbs down or you got problems here or let's lift up the uh, the rug on this big pothole you right. left. Yep. Yep. It's just <laughs> it's it's like there are easy fixes in this movie that just it just seems like they just were just lazy with it. It was just lazy and uh, I don't know. It it makes it so <laughs> it makes me so confused as to why they like because the movie uh, overall, like I, I rated it two and a half stars out of five on Letterboxd. Follow me on Letterboxd, Letterboxd.com slash upset as a viewer. Um but <laughs> uh I rated two and a half stars, which is, you know, middle 
it's it's right in the middle um but there was so much potential that could have could have made it stand out but it just it just didn't so rob savage if you're listening we're sorry for slinging shit at you but (laughs) it's just you know it's it's it is what it is (laughs) If you are smart, which I'm sure you are, Robert, um, <laughs> please take this and learn and grow. Yes. And, <laughs> you know, this is not us being petty. This is we are huge fans mm-hmm. of film and of Stephen King. Yes. And there were just opportunities where you could have made different choices. So next time, make yes. better choices. <laughs> and, yes. you know, you're going to be happy. We're going to be happy. This is yeah. for you, dude. <laughs> I want to say that he, I should have looked this up, but I want to say that he recently said, um, like, I think someone like on the, on the um, marketing circuit, and everything or the marketing push for the movie someone asked him uh the the quintessential question for anyone adapting king uh what would you want to adapt next what would you want to make uh next and he said and like my feelings about this movie notwithstanding uh he would want to make a new adaptation of the langoliers uh which could be interesting just in general like like that is that is just uh, a a good thought, but like, mm, yeah, I'm into it. I'm into any attempts, Robert. Mm-hmm. But um, here's the thing: you you better go hard. Like you yes. gotta you gotta bring it with Langoliers because yeah. that is a huge novella. It's mm-hmm. a big one. It's like this close to being a novel, yeah. and. There's a zillion characters. There's a lot of stuff going down. It's super sci-fi. Mm-hmm. You got a psychic child in there. You've got, ugh, and it's wild. So I know, um, I was talking to um, another constant reader buddy, um, nice. uh, Dave McCracken from the Stephen Kingdom. And yes. he would, he wanted to do Langoliers as well. And he said, from a budget standpoint, you could save a ton of cash. He's like, <laughs> You're you're just filming in like a little airplane, mm-hmm. couple rows of airplane seats. You could probably really do that on a budget, which yeah. would be good. Oh, but yeah. yeah, you need to go hard and you need to go dark to make Langolier successful. Yes. Yeah. And and there is so much like wild stuff in that 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 takes that would that would really need a someone who's not gonna be my assumption of this movie is that is that there's a lot of studio interference or there is there is a playbook that was required or heavily implied that he needed to follow to be like backed by the studio there's so much with the langoliers that is no pun intended up in the air and very <laughs> just cerebral and weird and out there like the sci-fi element of it is just so weird and trippy that that needs a certain level of creative freedom that I don't think someone without a lot of clout could get away with in the on the studio level. Um, so yeah, so that's my very diplomatic way of saying Mike Flanagan, make the Langoliers. <laughs> that was so beautifully said. So <laughs> wonderful you. in its PC angle. It's yes. Stunning, stunning. <laughs> Basically saying, Rob, we don't think you got the chops. Okay. Yeah. We, we appreciate and we know that you are <laughs> a, a lovely little dandelion making mm-hmm. your way, reaching for the sun. And we appreciate yes. that. But <laughs> <laughs> let's let the big boys do this one. Okay? Yeah, I will say I did really like Host, his movie from 2020. I did really like that. That was that was really good. The Langoliers. So I yeah, recommend I, this is a fun one. Matt, mm-hmm. what 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 assignment would you get, Rob? Which adaptation Ooh. do you feel would be delicate and dainty enough for him to maybe not um, screw up too much too much? Or like you said, have the studio screw it up too much? Okay. That is a great question. I'm I'm tempted to say like I'm I'm tempted despite everything we've said for the last hour and a half. Um, I'm tempted to go with a shorter story, but the boogeyman is bare bones as it is. So maybe 
if he had his hands on a on a bit of a longer one, maybe a novella. Um, I could, uh, I could see him maybe doing something interesting with uh, Dolan's Cadillac, maybe. Um, which is, have you read that one yet? I haven't. It's not ringing okay. a bell. I'm sorry. Yeah, that one is in. I think it's in Nightmares and Dreamscapes. Um, okay. That one is a is a revenge story about a man whose wife is killed by a mob guy, and so he figure like he works toward um, exacting revenge. Um, in the most wily coyote road runner way, and I mean that almost literally. <laughs> like <laughs> that's all I'll say about it. But it is such a weird and awesome revenge story. So so I think that. I think Rob Savage could do something unique with that. Um, yeah. Or if he wants to go more supernatural, uh, maybe um, something like, you know, they, you, uh, you know, they got a hell of a band, I think is the title. Um, the, the couple, the wayward travelers that go into a, uh, a town and that might also be Nightmares and Dreamscape, so you may not have read that one. Uh, but it's not ringing a bell. Okay, uh, it it's a good, good one, though. Yeah, it's yeah. a really good one. I'm um, excited. Yeah, yeah, I really recommend Nightmares and Dreamscapes if that is in that one because that is a very good collection. But of course, still, wholly recommend Night Shift. I'm very, very excited to hear what you think of that collection. <laughs> oh, um, it's gonna happen. It's yeah. gonna happen. Awesome. Right as you were uh, speaking, I was thinking in regards to what I would like to give Rob. Mm. And I think that I saw a lot of strength with the female casting of Sawyer and Sadie. Mm -hmm. And so I would like to take away his ability to go so heavy on the CGI for Supernatural and just really have him write a bomb script and get a killer actress for the gingerbread girl. Ooh, oh, yes. I would like to see him really, like really like put the knife to the cutting board there and get a great actress and give us a full on adrenaline thrill ride. And yes. Let's see how you do. Let's see that, how you do it. I, I like that. I like that. Yep. Um, yeah. All right. Well, you've got your assignment, Rob. Um, <laughs> and Mike Flanagan, if you're listening, you've got your assignments too. Like you can do whatever yeah. you want. Um, <laughs> like totally just, fine. Just, don't stop. Just yeah, make everything. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's our review of the boogeyman. Um, <laughs> any parting thoughts? If if you if you were one to do a rating system out of five stars, how would you rate it if you want to give a star amount uh, to a rating? Yeah, I think you were dead on with two and a half, Matt, and I think it's generous, but at the same time, it's also a little bit of a reprimand, and I yeah. I respect that, and I agree wholeheartedly. So I think I will also cast a vote for two and a half stars. Nice, well. nice. Well, same here. So uh, check out The Boogeyman in theaters. Um, I'm sure it'll or, hit Hulu. Yes, exactly. <laughs> or you can, you know, save a couple bucks. And right. Wait. <laughs> yes. That is, <laughs> <And>. yeah. <laughs> yep, uh, absolutely. So since The Boogeyman is a pretty loose adaptation of Stephen King, uh, I had asked you, Kim, to pick a story for us to kind of wind down the show and talk about a, a, a short story of Stephen King's. And you chose the uh, short story, The Man in the Black Suit, uh, which was originally published in the Halloween edition, uh, Halloween 1994 edition of The New Yorker on October 31st, of course. Um, 
And it was then collected in 2002's Everything's Eventual. Um, the A little bit of the premise I have is set in the fictional town of Mountain, Maine, the man in the black suit recounts the tale of Gary, a nine-year-old boy whose brother died not long ago due to a bee sting. One day, Gary goes out fishing and falls asleep. When he awakens, he's startled to discover a bee sitting on the edge of his nose, and then other uh, devilish shenanigans ensue. Um... Kim, I know that you are a very big fan of this story. Um, do you want to give us uh, your thoughts? We're 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 gonna go full spoilers. So if you haven't read this story, go read it. Come back. Uh, but we're just gonna go full spoilers ahead. Uh, Kim, what's your history with this story, and what what made you choose it? <laughs> okay. So, firstly, Matt. H, thank you so, 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 so much that I could choose this story and talk about it on your show because I'm in love with it. <laughs> so me mega, mega thanks for that. I first read this when I was just getting the podcast off the ground in 2020 nice. and wanted to get a short story collection going and I just opened up Everything's Eventual and it's one of the first stories. And I just was blown away really by that first page of how beautiful every single line is. Mm -hmm. Matt. It is just a stunningly written story. It is 25 pages of melancholy, a really, really frightening childhood trauma that has haunted this yes. young boy named Gary until he's in our, our narrator is Gary at like 99 years old. Right which is wow. And then we just get soaked in this cultural uh, beauty of this small town, rural, mm -hmm. you know, this rural main town before the 1920s, before anything is happening. And this young boy's traumatic afternoon when he yes. just went to go catch some fish by himself. And my God, Matt, every line of this story is beautiful. <laughs> Every single line is stunning. It really, it really freaking is. And like, as much as I have loved dabbling with other fiction, other horror and thriller fiction writers recently, and I've, I've read a lot of good stuff and everything, just the character work of Stephen King, like when you when you get away from Stephen King for a little bit and then come back to him and you read something that even you've already read, like I read this before a couple of years ago and like rereading it, it just it just smacks you in the face with how real everything is like he is telling a story about a kid in like 1914 and you are transported there like he is. It is it is such a beautifully constructed story. He is creating this world out of nothing and having this this character go through a traumatic experience and grief and just doing like and, and implementing so much like supernatural stuff. It is it is a great example of how he is just a master storyteller. It is it is just mind-boggling how he can do that <laughs> oh i'm so happy you love it as much as i do because yeah. it's just like you said in 25 pages matt he yes. makes magic he makes stunning literary magic that is memorable and haunting and just this is such a white hot story of this this poor young boy what he survives but also the man in the black suit is terrifying oh, absolutely and it, it is it is such an interest like seeing like the manipulative devil character in fiction is is always like it's always like insane it's always scary and everything and having the man in the black suit like really really just go for Gary's grief, his fears. Like he is in the shadow of his brother dying from a bee sting. And the man in the black suit is just telling him, yeah, your mother's dead. And it was a bee and everything. And just like working through that is just the torment of that in the way that it's a reflection of Gary's like grief and his wounds of, of losing his, his brother is 
like you said, 25 pages. That is insane. Insane. It's nuts. And to build upon that memory you were referencing, or not memory, but that part in the story where he tells Gary, like, yeah, your your mom's like dead right now. The other part that haunts me to my soul, Matt, is he says something along the lines of like, well, now that your mother's gone, your dad's going to want to stick it somewhere warm. <laughs> yes. And oh, my next. God. I'm like, oh, my. yes. Oh, my God. That that I had forgotten about that. And I was just like, I, it, it is. It's horrifying. It is, and it is so. It's horrifying. That's in, like, that's <laughs> the escalation of that because he is he's telling Gary like he's just like he is being this like manipulative, mischievous devil person, and then it goes he like cranks it up to eleven, yes, to just really hammer home the fear and the torment, and it is. It uh, it's so it's so well written and disgusting and horrifying. It is ah, uh, it's um, it's incredible. It's incredible. It really, it really is. He just hits yeah. the gas when you're already really nervous for Gary. Yeah, because the like you said, the physical description of the man in the black suit is like startling. Yes, startling. Everybody like this guy is creep town. Yep, and. And then when he starts to speak and then what he so unsettling, so yes. disarming, so unsettling. And then just the graphic adult horror that he, yeah. I don't think Gary understood it all at the time, mm. but it makes so much sense that like our narrator at the age of 99 is saying like, I have thought about this in my nightmares every day since yeah. I was a child. Jesus. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it is uh it is it is horrific and and just so, so well done. Like the description of the man in the black suit, like I think I don't know verbatim what it is, but uh he refers he says that it looks like his his insides are on fire or something like that. And I was just like, that is so vivid. Maybe not vivid enough for me to remember verbatim a few hours later, but still, <laughs> it's a very vivid description, and it is it is just incredible. Like it is, it's fantastic. I I love the way that King can he can do no wrong. <laughs> like even like he the way that he can just put this in such a short story and then do like he he's amazing i don't know <laughs> <laughs> i know it makes me bug out it absolutely mm -hmm. just makes my brain spiral and that's why this story is a top five for me this is mm -hmm. a top five this is a gold this gets gold and yeah. i i just am obsessed with how every line it seems like it's just so beautifully thought out it's very poetic mm -hmm. but you could tell you could tell he just this just came out in and I think there's an author's note because I recently reread it for the mm -hmm. show. And he says that he thought it was trash when he finished. He was like, Jeez. I'm really, he's like, I'm really not happy with this one. And I'm like, oh my God, dude, like yeah. this, you just, this is a, a golden nugget that you just cracked out. And he right? was not feeling it. I guess he must have had a complicated time in the writing process, but mm -hmm. it really seems like every line is just this poetic delivery in the midst of, so you've got all this beautiful writing in the midst of this like freaking terror show. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm trying to discreetly see where I have it ranked in my... Um, oh yeah, what's your ranking? I, I sat, I don't have it ranked in my top 19 of short stories. That might be might have to be something I maybe reconsider. Um, but in terms of uh, everything's eventual, um, geez, I did not give it enough love. I have it ranked nine <laughs> out of 14. That's uh, but that's also. I mean, King, like <laughs> nine out of 14 isn't bad because everything is pretty much gold for, for the most part. So, so right. yeah, uh, I might have to reconsider some of that, but, but yeah, it is still, <laughs> it's, it's still very much, uh, up there for me. 
even if it's not yeah. on paper. <laughs> you have also read, I think, a lot more than me. So I think that the 9 out of 14 might be something. It mm-hmm. might be something, and I just haven't made it there yet. Sure. I... This oh god, this story blew me away. It continues mm-hmm. to blow me away. It is beautifully told, mixed with really haunting, memorable plot and character work. We've got that wonderful, melancholy narrator that's kind of reporting to us from old age. So there's a lot of yeah. poignancy. This is just firing on all cylinders and. I think I, I recommend this to so many people who really want to be wowed by King. Like, do you really want to see what this guy can do? Because I'm going to show you. Absolutely. And in the structure of it also with Gary as an old man in, in the nursing home telling the story. I I wonder if like the the nugget of that carried over to when he wrote uh, The Green Mile because similar kind of uh, structure and everything. But it's just like when he does that, when he does that kind of storytelling where it's uh, like someone like bearing their soul from like trauma that they experienced or, or what have you, it is always just so, so authentic when it's in the narrator's voice. It's just there. He's a master. He's just he so is. great. He is. This one is yeah. so real for me. Mm-hmm. So real. And I love that it takes place in 1914. I think mm-hmm. that the fact that it is in that time makes it even more luxurious in terms of looking at the world when it was just so small and new and there wasn't much going on. And yeah, it, I think in any other time period, it wouldn't have worked as well. I both agree. Because... Gary's so vulnerable. Holy yeah. crap. And, so vulnerable. And that like level of like uh paternal like protection of him, like when he when Gary is going back after the encounter with the the man in the black suit and he sees his father and he's in like Gary is in hysterics about his mother and like his father is just so calming and he's like he's logically like he's telling him logically like I was there 30 minutes ago. She gave me these these sandwiches. Like, there's no way that anything has happened to her and everything. And just like the underlying, the underlying um uh kind of uh, the undercurrent of that with him describing his father when he brought back his his brother and he was in tears and shambles and everything, and he was protecting uh like he had covered he'd covered uh his brother to protect uh his wife from having seen like the bloated corpse and everything just like there's this just undercurrent of just a beautiful father fatherhood father son story that is on the back burner but is just so like if you connect with it you connect with it it is it's it's incredible yeah I love it. This to me, Matt, like when I first read this, I was like, this is literary fiction. Like Mm -hmm. this is absolutely at that high level. This is that caliber. This is what we get in grad school. And this is like the highbrow snob stuff that (laughs) I, that was the, that was the only life I knew, Matt, before King was just like (laughs) snob stuff and really, really dense weird boring stuff and and the, I, you read something like man in the black suit that's a kick-ass ride completely mm-hmm. entertaining but you're like it's literary fiction he's done yeah. it he's he's giving us high caliber beauty at and at the same time it's in that like burger and fries <laughs> delivery right yeah i just he's the master how oh, do you do absolutely. both absolutely yeah how do you do both it's 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 insane. It's just so, yeah, it's, it's great. Yep. <laughs> it makes me so happy that you like it too. Yeah. I was, I like, I, when I was re re listening to it, the audiobook, I was just like, I like, <laughs> it was the end of the day, um, at work and I'm like listening to it and I'm just like, I, I'm done working for the day. <laughs> I'm like, I'm just going <laughs> to focus on this. Uh, not really. I did do work, but anyway, like I was just so engrossed by it, and I was just so so taken with it. I I loved it. 
Yay! Oh yep. my god. That, <laughs> thank you for letting me just sing its praises on your show because I, yeah. I really want people to spend some time with this one. Same here. Absolutely. And obviously, thank you for coming on and everything. We can kind of wind down. Uh, if I... <laughs> I said I was probably going to kind of cut out that stupid uh, TikTok thing, but like my stupid brain now is like my, my, to sum up the man in the black suit, bees were a mistake. Um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, so dumb. Anyway, um, yeah. That was so, a genuine chuckle. So somebody, thank you. somebody out there, I think you could sell it. I think it's cute. All right. Well, thank you. <laughs> uh, okay. So we, that, that's it. Like we did it. We reviewed the man in the black suit. Um, Kim, thank you so much for coming on and for, for joining me for this. Um, I'm glad that we got the, we, we got kind of a, a mixed, a, a mix in terms of the content of the review, in terms of our feelings toward each thing that we're reviewing. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, so thanks again. And could you tell people like where they can find you online, all your socials, and uh, what's what's to come on the year of underrated Stephen King? Oh, thank you so much once more, Matt. I love it here. I could talk to you for five more hours if we both didn't have to like sleep and work and do these things. Same. <laughs> and what a joy it was to come full circle with the boogeyman, do yes. the night shift story, do the film adaptation. Oh man, I want to sign up for all of those. I want to nice. do all the all the three sixties with you. Nice. So it's just <laughs> such a joy getting to share my love of King with you. So thank you so much for letting me be a guest. It's as as frequently as I have. Absolutely, I'm, anytime. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I I feel like I'm just always busting in on the party, being like, "Oh, I'm here." <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. You are fully welcome anytime. Um, and yeah, so we're, the, yeah. <laughs> the show is, uh, I want to say we're on all the major platforms, but if you need any assistance, you can reach out on Instagram and Twitter. I think for Twitter, it's underrated SK pod. It should be something similar for Instagram. I'm <laughs> drawing a blank. Uh, or if you want to go old school and meet me in the middle, you can write me at underrated SK at Gmail. Because I'm a teacher, I am frequently, hourly, every 15 minutes, checking emails <laughs> to respond to students. So I will. I would love to hear from you guys and... And uh, yeah, see your learn your thoughts about the show, or if I've made an egregious error on one of the novels, <laughs> I really want to remedy that because I I made a, I made some boo boos, Matt. I've made some <laughs> some faux pas. Um, I was saying Cuthbert's name wrong for a good whole episode. To be fair, <laughs> that is there there is some like. Uh, gray area there. I think one of the narrators refers to him as Cuthbert. The other narrator refers to him as Cuthbert. So that you're 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 totally fine there. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good because I was like I was gonna pass out. I was like oh, hi, that is a that is a huge sin committed. Um, but yeah, we are all everywhere as as everywhere as we can be. We are not on TikTok. I, mm, I'm enjoying yeah. TikTok, but the show is not on TikTok. <laughs> so right now I am reading a very well-known King title and it's a super surprise. So I'm going to do, I think I'm going to sneak in this super surprise episode. Nice. And then shortly after that, I'm going to begin my fairy tale coverage. Awesome. So that'll be like my hopefully end of summer book. It will be fairy tale. And then I'm going back to the Dark Tower, Matt. Yes. I yes. I am rejoining Roland and the Cotet, but um, I'm doing a little diff, and I I'm gonna I'm gonna go to win through the keyhole. Nice, nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. So I, I want to spend some time in the uh, Wizard and Glass zone, just a little longer. Totally so, understandable. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I'm, that's the plan. Yeah. I'm very excited for you. I'm very, very excited. So, yep. yeah. My hope is, is that after Wind Through the Keyhole, I can get on track with some Night Shift stuff because that should be spooky nice. time. Oh, yeah. Should be spooky time. So I would like to do some Night Shift coverage if possible. Or 
I, I don't know. I'm really feeling some vampires. So mm-hmm. I might, I might have to do a Salem's Lot reread because it's calling my name. That, Maybe. <laughs> yes. I know. Yeah. So I, yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, <laughs> I think, you know, so Salem's Lot is a book that I have kind of a mixed feelings toward and everything. I would say definitely pl- i would actually say please do that <laughs> cool. like maybe okay. after win through the keyhole and like i because because i would love to get your read on it and uh and give me an excuse to read it read it as well uh, reread Yay! it for like the upteenth time <laughs> so yeah um yeah okay i i would i that is that is my plea to you is to <laughs> do salem's lot Excellent, excellent. Yeah. All right, that's that's gonna rank higher because nice because because Matt said so. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, okay, well, I'm gonna start winding us down. Uh, Kim, thank you so much. It's been a blast as it always is, and uh, we're gonna have you back uh, sooner rather than later. We talked off mic about it, and yeah, uh, we're 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 gonna have you back soon. Um, once again, you can find us at Tower Junkies all over the internet, Tower Junkies Pod, uh, and also at TowerJunkiesPod.com. Once again, please consider contributing to the or con- joining the Patreon uh, <laughs> <laughs> that we do, um, doing weekly uh, Stephen King read along reviews of all the Holly Gibney stories. I also have a massive, massive backlog of short story collection reviews and. Um, Stephen King commentary tracks, just a ton of stuff. Patreon.com slash obsessive viewer. There is a special $4 uh, tier that is just for Stephen King content. But if you want to do more, then you know, you also get access to a bunch of other stuff, including read along reviews of the expanse series, a sci-fi series by James S.A. Corey, where I'm going book by book, six parts for each book and nine book series all this year. So, uh, check that out. Patreon.com slash obsessive viewer. I'm going to start playing us out. Thank you once again, Kim, for joining me. Uh, this has been a blast and can't wait to talk to you more. Um, and hopefully next time the the movie's better (laughs) so (laughs) thanks for being my Stephen King bestie of course always so all right well thank you guys so much for listening and I'll see you in the next episode and now enjoy this short clip from our patreon exclusive rss feed For the full clip and more exclusive Patreon content, such as early access to episodes, TV book and movie reviews and reaction recordings, commentary tracks, and Patreon potpourri episodes, go to patreon.com slash obsessive viewer and become a patron at the minimum rate of $1 per month. Thank you and enjoy. And then this third section just brings it to a head in such a satisfying way that, again, isn't necessarily contingent on that buildup. That buildup felt more organic than than it would have felt like cinematic. Like it, it feels like the book is organically bringing these characters together, intersecting them, putting them, uh, putting them into a precarious situation, putting Pete into danger without him realizing that he's in danger until it's almost too late. But it's in an it's in an organic way. It's not like it's like even to even to kind of bring up King's penchant for um, for putting to putting uh, tense moments into like foreshadowing, like putting foreshadowing into tense moments. This podcast was edited and produced by Matt Hurt and presented by ObsessiveViewer.com. You can find links to all of our shows at ObsessiveViewer.com slash podcasts. For exclusive bonus content, including reviews, commentaries, and B-roll episodes, you can subscribe to our Patreon at patreon.com slash obsessiveviewer. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode.